joining us today at the Future 4200 Good Life Gang 420 uh, meetup here in Long Beach, California. I am with my uh, esteemed colleagues, Ann Boris. Uh, we're super excited about this conversation. And we are going to be talking about manufacturing equipment, which is a huge conversation near and dear to my heart. And um, what I want to do first is, is start at my right, start with Zev, grab a mic, and let's go down the panel, introduce yourself. And, um, you know, give me 20 seconds about what you do in the space, and then let's kick off the conversation. Hi, I'm Zev, the uh, manufacturer of the x Spiral line of equipment. We use membrane-based separations to uh, create uh, energy savings in the manufacturing field, uh, recovering solvent with 5% the energy usage of uh, falling films and other traditional technologies, as well as reducing the need for chilling with inline purification membranes that can remove wax and lipids. It's awesome. Awesome. Yeah, Alex. It's on. Is that on? Mm -hmm. Hey guys, I'm Alex, C1 D1 Labs. Um, we're obviously most known for our C1 D1 extraction rooms. We also do large scale industrial architectural and engineering planning in addition to engineer peer reviews and also um, manufacturing and fabrication of stainless steel uh, equipment here in Carson City, Nevada. Um, and as well as uh, all supplying equipment all over the world. Yeah, thank you. Noah. Hi, I'm Noah Cook. I'm with Ethos Manufacturing. I'm the head of R&D, and we offer ethanol extraction and recovery solutions, um, mostly large-scale extraction and several uh, membrane solutions for purifying and a lot of what Zev said. So. <laughs> uh, I, we'll get into that. It is a lot of what Zev said. <laughs> Um, and we're constantly uh, innovating and developing new technologies uh, to have the lowest cap uh, capex um, and opex on the market. I love it. Uh, Boris can start with that other mic if you want. We can kind of do three and three. Check, check. Go. Hey, Boris. Hey, uh, I'm Boris. I Hello. own Busy Bee. We build um, closed loop systems for hydrocarbon primarily, and we also do some ethanol extraction and ethanol recovery with falling films, and we work with some of the people here as well. Yeah. And we also are doing some booth prototyping, and we might be talking to you about that soon, and... We just generally try to innovate and make quality products with very little emphasis on cost savings. Wow. Okay. Well, yeah. we're going to get Morris into that. Gets around. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yep. We'll add diamonds if you like. <laughs> Andrew. Cool. Hey, guys. Um, Andrew with Extractor Depot. Um, Extractor Depot is um, kind of like the Home Depot for extractors. Uh, we carry a lot of parts and full systems and try to provide uh, services so you can repair everything that you guys use in the lab. So. Uh, just a full suite of products and services. Um, and we also work with a lot of, you know, you guys here and um, whatnot. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Dirty. <laughs> Dirty. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Harrison, mainly known as Dirty Harry. Uh, I'm a producer processor. Um, not only do I purchase a lot of equipment from these gentlemen, but I also uh, co-own a company with Boris here, Accurate Extraction. Um, you know, uh, so I do much a lot more of... accessible than your last company, Interaccurate Extraction. It's yeah, like, uh, <laughs> didn't didn't work. Yeah, <laughs> precision. <laughs> oh. Um, whoa! Whoa! No, I think. <laughs> no, um, you know, yeah, be, because I process a lot. You know, uh, I work a lot with these gentlemen as far as being able to mm -hmm. kind of, you know, help co-design co a lot of stuff and uh, give a lot of feedback that goes into uh, producing a lot of uh, extraordinary equipment. Keep the microphone, and I want to start with you. Uh -oh. So um, somebody was talking about a piece of equipment that's super exciting. That's a really long cord. You can pull on it, and you're going to be okay. Um, somebody was talking about a piece of equipment, and they said, uh, you know, it's $3 million, and it makes like three grams an hour, but it fully separates delta-8 and delta-9. And I'm like, if you gave me $3 million, I could figure out how to separate delta-8 and delta-9 in a minute. You know, and so um, – where are your pinch points with equipment? Is it scalability? Is it is it accuracy? Like, what do you feel like are some of the places where you wish there was another solution on the market? Well, I think, I mean, that's just a really expensive solution to a problem that shouldn't exist if you have the chemistry already figured out. There you so go. you're kind of trying to like, you know, put a bucket underneath a leak, you know, mm -hmm. when really you should just fix the leak. Okay. Um, okay. So, you know, that would be my initial opinion on that subject. But 
Okay, also, so to, and to be clear, what you're saying is if you're isomerizing Delta 8, we want to go into it with a solid SOP that gives you good results instead of spending a bunch of money to... If you have $3 million, dollars, I will provide you with that SOP. Uh, if you, I mean, if you, <laughs> if, you bought, if, if, if you could give me three bucks for it right now because it's free on the internet. And so I'll split it with Ken. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, yeah, I think also, too, as, as far as these, like, astronomical amounts of money that are being thrown at equipment, I mean, that's, you know, as far as, like, us who sell equipment, that's exciting. And we can definitely all pretty much here build you something, absolutely, for $3 million. But I really do want to stress on, you know, most people here, uh, we really want what's best for the customer. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why everybody here is still really in business. There have been quite mm -hmm. a few people that have come mm -hmm. in, built products, tried to charge a lot of money, and they're no longer around because they don't really have that like user in support. And they're really just trying to extract money from the people instead mm -hmm. of building something that's more reasonable. And that's why I always like suggest that people grow organically. Mm -hmm. You know, Especially if you're new to the industry, something that's important is, is just to, like, you know, don't throw $3 million at something. Figure out if you can be successful with one million dollars first. I, I'd love to, if you pass the microphone to Andrew, this is the third panel and it's the third panel where someone has said, instead of taking on huge investment and starting out with a two million dollar lab, <clears throat> start with things that you can buy in Extractor Depot and work your way up and pay for your lab as you go. Andrew, exactly. that's how you've been servicing. I mean, right. you know, that's how you've been servicing yeah. your customers. Tell right. me about what that model looks like. Well, it all started because I was an extractor myself. And, um, you know, when I started, it was impossible to find anything locally uh, to, you know, you couldn't even buy dry ice really easily <laughs> at that time. And so there wasn't a infrastructure built for extractors to actually do what they needed to do. And so I think that was a big part of what the industry was missing was kind of like other industries. You can go out and buy welding supplies and things like that anywhere in the country and find it at least within, you know, 30 sure. minutes to an hour. But right now, that or like right now, that's not an issue for extractors because there's a lot of businesses that have popped up uh, servicing that industry. So I think that's a big part of it. And um, just, you know, this industry started very uh, in an infant stage and not everyone had a hundred thousand dollars to buy a big piece of equipment. They had to start with a, a tube mm -hmm. in the backyard mm -hmm. and that's how everyone got going. Mm -hmm. And it's sad to say, with but it. I mean, it's everyone did that at, <laughs> yeah. at the beginning. And so, or buckets with alcohol, you mm -hmm. know, whatever you had to do. And it so it's doing things like that, that I think that started this industry. Um, but you know, as this industry evolves and more money comes into the industry, I think that scale that, increases at an exponential rate. We're seeing it every day. And I think, you know, that's where you have to kind of time the size of the equipment with where the market is at and really be aware of exactly what our customers needing out there. They don't, they might not need a 10,000 pound system right now. Mm -hmm. uh, they need something, you know, a hundred mm -hmm. times smaller or right. not. So I think that's a big part of it. Boris, you, you unapologetically <laughs> do not try to save your customers money. Well, that's not true. I just am focused entirely on quality with mm -hmm. a capital Q. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for ballers, not petty people. So, mm -hmm. I mean, a Is system there that... Is a point at which there's diminishing returns? Is there a point at which, like, I could take... And, and I want to say that, um, you know, I started transitioning into cannabis in, like, 2009, 2010, mm -hmm. and I had a list of the extractors I knew of, mm -hmm. and you are one of the two on my list of maybe five because this is pre-ets whatever oh i came but after ets busy. well they weren't even on my radar got it busy b was on my radar first so so recommending that equipment and you've stood the test of time i mean how long has your business been 2015 is when since, we started since 2015 i mean the r d it, it, i learned how to extract hash oil in 2013 on an ets yeah the 1300 yeah and busy b was born from the quest to improve the quality of the tools well, i had to was make not work with addressing dejanglification Ooh, or do you know about dejanglification any, how about double dejanglification I, I follow that hashtag for us are you serious i'm wow. a fan wow uh, I know you're, you're fluffing me up right now, but, <laughs> but wait, hold on. Back to this topic, though, about yeah, starting yes. small and growing. Yes. Even though we make only the highest quality equipment, where yeah. we try to use the best parts, it's mm -hmm. why we kind of moved this whole industry over to swage lock from simple tri-clamp stuff. please preach? Yes. Yeah, because it's, I mean, swage lock is unnecessary at these pressures. It's really just about bling mm -hmm. and about ergonomics and usability. Mm -hmm. And it's, honestly, it's kind of a fetish object the um, extractor is. I mean, it's shiny and steel and made from tubes and shit. And hash hey, nerds, if you want to see a fetish object, you need to see his new sight glass. Because whoa, Alex's I already new, did see it. Actually, it's beautiful. It's, I like that. It's a half-inch swage lock compression. I love it. It's from Dad's. 
I love it. Yeah. But we actually are all about starting small and scaling up. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's literally how we started. Mm -hmm. And so we, we sell a small system, an extra small system that's 15 grand. And then you, mm -hmm. my motto is reinvest your, don't spend all your principal, reinvest your profits, yeah. scale up over time. Alex, the, the, grab a mic here and speak to this. The companies that you're do, doing business with for the most part are, are funded in my experience in your business, which I have like a tiny little bit, answered your phones for a year. Um, but the companies that you're working with are typically well-funded and they're going into a new market. We're in Michigan, Oklahoma, whatever. They're going into a new market and they're going in hard with a, with a full lab. Speak to the difference in servicing that business effectively than one that's like growing growing over time. Like these people want to walk in on day one and open the door and a full lab suite is there. And that's what you're trying to provide. Tell me about the challenges. The biggest thing is they're looking for A to Z. Yeah. They're looking for architectural engineering, fire protection, someone who's experienced dealing with red tape, someone who's experienced dealing with municipalities mm -hmm. and someone who's friendly and knowledgeable with all these guys. Right. Um, cause realistically every client ha has either want, demand, or currently has a piece of equipment from someone mm -hmm. sitting at this table. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also new equipment emerging, um, which they want us to have our hands on. Right. Um, so knowing companies that are popping out new membrane pieces of equipment and falling film technology and uh, new and affordable pricing, it's, it's kind of the full package, right? We can give uh, almost a third party, I want to say necessarily third party, because we do sell them and, and fabricate and peer review some of our own equipment, but we are able to diversify enough to where we can successfully give consulting that's not all around our product because we can still make money 15 different ways. We sell a booth, we're mm -hmm. stoked if it's a busy bee product inside of it or not, or, or mm -hmm. if, if, if it's our product or, or, not. or, or not. sorry, <laughs> let, me, let me rephrase There's that. No if not. it's a busy bee product or, or, or one of something that, you know, I, I may have or, or whatever, yeah. if it's an ethanol piece of equipment, it doesn't necessarily have to be my equipment to make money. So by having that full diverse package, we're able to supply um, an A to Z that ultimately gets the client there without 15 people with 15 different opinions with 15 different engineers who have no idea what they're doing. You definitely. And, and Noah, can you pass that to Noah for me, Alex? Noah, speak a little bit to when you introduced yourself, you said you're trying to reduce cap capital expenditures, reduce operating expenditures, bringing overhead down. I mean, you've been in the industry a long time. Tell me about the transition between when our customers were counting profits in dollars and when our customers are counting profits in fractions of cents, what that does to the, to the manufacturing spend and how that changes it. Um, well, I came with a background in extraction and um, a co-owner of a large manufacturing facility in East LA. And we were uh, hit very, very hard with, uh, with vape gate. Uh, we saw it. We saw the well, and thankfully, COVID plummet. took care of that. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> Not <in> time. <laughs> but, but uh, so we, we, we had designed our, uh, our system built around the idea that pens were going to be one of the more marketable, uh, marketable products. After Vapegate, that wasn't the case. And in LA, we, you know, we saw that distillate we have a safe full of it and nobody wanted to buy it. So we really looked at um, the fact that we had built a large extraction uh, line and we had an offshoot uh, among two of our uh, two partners, me and Travis Turner, um, joined up with uh, three other extremely intelligent individuals with backgrounds in uh, finance, uh, software and environmental remediation. And we really decided that uh, the best, you know, we were going to bring equipment that was affordable for folks like farmers. And mm -hmm. our large scale equipment is uh, best fitted for hemp extraction. And over time we uh, started to see that the money there is even limited. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, we started bringing in smaller extraction and scalable solutions. Uh, to where it's, we, we want to provide a, an affordable product and, uh, also have that product run for a long period of time sure. with efficient, uh, protocols built around it. Sure. Harrison. Uh, yeah. I think right. speaking to kind of organic growth, each one of these gentlemen on here have 
a product yeah, that's and kind Boris. of Boris. Yeah. Okay. And Boris. Specifically Boris. This will be one of his favorite words. He's gonna freak out. He doesn't have a microphone in his hand when I say it. Is that most of these things are are, are, are the things that they've built can they're modular, you know, mm -hmm. like they can be added on to. You know, if mm -hmm. you take the side of one of his racks, you can bolt on an entire another rack. Mm -hmm. So as mm -hmm. far as like growing organically, you can start off with a system that you can easily expand on with a lot of the different products that they have. Like your membrane system that you have, right? Like you can add more. You can almost stack one on top of we, it. We've gone anywhere from 50 gallons per hour to 600 gallons per hour. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's all pretty much like it can be built modularly with just more membranes added on. Yeah. Like your columns, how many columns can you run in a row? There is no limit. Right, there is and no limit. And scalability, well, there is right. a limit. There is a limit, and Alex will tell you about it. It has to do with your fire marshal. I mean, you're, 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 limit, you're limited to right. you're limited well, to this artificial regulatory scheme, but MAQs. which is, right. MAQs. Yes. But, but we can yes. get four control areas per... But you, but you hear me. The, 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 yes. 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 The limit so, is not in the equipment. The well, limit is in, you got to grab a mic. So, so a well, yeah, yeah. One thing, though, that I just want to finish on, though, too, because that brings in, a, like... The next real question is, is that you have to have an honest conversation with your manufacturer. And if your manufacturer isn't asking you these questions, these are the ones that you should ask them. Mm -hmm. Because how much electricity do you can you tap into? How mm -hmm. much space do mm -hmm. you have? What is your how desired many, output? How many three phase drops? Right. Like like do drawing. you want to run a do you <laughs> want to run a Midex Crydex 60? If you don't have three phase 480, mm -hmm. good fucking luck. Mm -hmm. Excuse my language. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's these are the things that you need to communicate with them because one of the nightmares that each one of us have all had is we've shown up to install something that you've purchased and you don't have the back end figured out. And then And you know whose fault that is? That's on me. Well, As the salesperson, that's on me. Go, but Boris, tell me, respond to that. Well, I just wanted to respond to the MAQ issue. Yeah. Because you're, you're right. Ultimately, the limit is what your fire marshals will allow you in the booth. And there's mm -hmm. this thing called NFPA, which mm -hmm. is like universal. Mm -hmm. And we're basically all limited to 150 pounds or 300 pounds in a booth, depending right. on whether we have sprinklers mm -hmm. or not. So, you know, you can multiply that by four on, on a, in a building if you have mm -hmm. like, what, one or two hour burn rated walls mm -hmm. and stuff. Right. But hold on one sec. So let's say 300 is the number. We have to design systems that can get you maximum productivity One out of 300 yes. pounds of butane. Yes. Now, how do we yes. do that? It's called putting it in flight. It's like yeah. juggling. Yeah. How do I hold mm -hmm. five balls in my hands? Mm -hmm. Well, I put three of them in the air and keep yeah. juggling them. So really, that's what the butane mm -hmm. falling film innovation was all about, 2018. Mm -hmm. It's taking the ethanol falling films mm -hmm. that we had built, adapting them to butane mm -hmm. so that we can literally do continuous inline recovery and rip solvent off of live resin as fast mm -hmm. as we can run it through material columns. Now the question is, how many times can we run that 300 pound MAQ per hour? Can we do two full runs an hour? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. badass. Yeah. 1.5. Yeah. Alex, speak, speak to that and then let's hear what Zev has to say. <clears throat> no, and everyone is, is up, up to speed on MAQs. I think we've all had enough experience with clients in our own facilities um, to, to be well aware of these codes now. And um, obviously dealing with experience is, is how you get that success. But um, C1D1 Labs patented a one hour fire rate uh, booth and we defined it as a control area uh, within our engineer peer review. Mm -hmm. um, so that we can lay down more than one of these rooms next to each other without having to build any walls in between. Mm -hmm. um, this means that the actual panels of the room are one hour fire rated, defining them as a control area, separating the solvents, mm -hmm. um, and the door is obviously fire rated itself as well. Um, the dampers and so forth uh, through the ducting. Mm -hmm. And this gives you... Uh, the ability to have up to 1,200 pounds of butane. And I know that Boris, Extractor Depot... Okay, that's 1,200 pounds of butane. But to be clear, I need four busy bees because the, the, it can't, that can't just be an, at one extractor because I'm in four you, rooms. I'm you in four can, rooms. You, you can't have... modularize anyway. You, yeah. If you're going that large, you, you would li likely have a bulk feed tank. Um, uh, Outside. Oh, interesting. That so there's ways to do it. Another doubler on your MAQ, right. couldn't it? You um, could get up to 600. Well, you can manifold it so the, the butane system's in use, so it's inside the system. Um, Limits so it to 300 in the room. In use and in storage. Right. Because right. right. so you to got to top off. It has to be X amount of feet from the building. Got it. Do I need this? You yeah, do. probably. It has to be X amount of feet away from the building, like for holding tanks and stuff. I built one in Adelanto. It's a nightmare, but you can definitely pull it off. And in a lot of places, like, like for instance, Long Beach, this is the other thing too. Hey, and this and is fun. I'm just, this is, we didn't talk about this beforehand. And this is to anybody in the room or to anybody who's here. Uh, the, the fire marshal in Long Beach is named? 
Vince. Vince. Okay, everybody and knows, <laughs> and we love him. We, we do. Love him. God bless you, Vince. Anoint all of our projects. We we lay we lay incense at your altar. But 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 it's like we know these fire marshals on a first name basis. Zev, uh, talk to me about this conversation. I know you've had a couple things to say. Jump in here. The conversation about whether saving cost is like the most important. Tell thing. me. Uh, when I, I I used to rock the bucket tech ethanol extraction myself bucket for a, for a couple of years, uh, and I was also in a lab that was 400 square feet during that whole wow. time. And beyond even saving costs, there was actually a time when if we wanted to buy a piece of equipment, the biggest question was, is there physical space in the lab to get it? And if I wanted to get something as simple as a rotovap, I had to Tetris everything in the whole lab and completely reorganize it to make space for that. Uh, when I was starting my company, uh, there weren't really any small membrane skids that were under uh, 100 grand on the market or would fit through a regular door. So I made sure when I was developing mine that I could fit it no matter how tight the space was, even if I was in back in my old lab. Uh, now I think you have a you do have one that can fit through a regular door, yeah, and I've got and I've got some larger ones now too, so it's not as distinctive. But uh, so so just I kept that close at heart. Well, and and we're getting we're getting comments on the forum. It's awesome for the first time we're live streaming to the Future Forty Two Hundred forum. Ooh, comments. So we're getting comments some questions for us. Um, that, from um, the audience. That was okay. So hey, I wish I'd have thought about that and segued by saying we're getting chats from the audience. Boris, it's like you and I share one brain. Um, so people are over here. I know. Think about it. Um, uh, people are over here talking about GMP. And here's what I want to say about GMP. Raise your... Okay. Be honest. Ask them what it means. And the, Thank you, The boys. meaning of the acronym isn't hand. good enough. You need, to, you need to have a mic. I want, I want you by a show of hands, by a show of hands, yep. I want you to tell me how many truly yeah. CGMP labs you have physically been in. Has anybody been in one? Let me replace that with another question. When people oh, no, ask no, me, I'm, a, I'm asking the question, so don't replace it yet. Oh, for cannabis, a cannabis GMP lab? No, no. You've been in co compliant, but it's not a GMP lab. But you know why there's not? Because what does it mean? Is my until first question. there's a data logger, I've never had until there's a data logger batch tracking everything about your extractor, the equipment doesn't exist. I'm mm. telling you, from coming from a pharma background, we have that data logging. These, you can do data logging, but it has to be. Uh, chapter 6 FDA, chapter 16 FR, whatever. I can't even say the chapter anymore. There are so many levels to it. So people are saying on the chat, because yeah. people on the Future Forum know everything, um, <sighs> why don't all you idiots just build a GMP lab and go by those hey, standards? Can I ask them a question? The yes. same question I ask every yes. single client who ever asks me, is your stuff GMP? I say... Could you tell me what GMP no, means? Yeah. And you know what they say? No, they all say good manufacturing practice. I say, great. You know what the freaking three letters mean? Can you tell me, can you send me the spec of what yeah. you need? Mm -hmm. And nobody knows. No, so yeah. specifically, um, it has to do with a lot of the SOPs and the guys. QA can, and SOPs and, they, they, and tracking so like, and all this there's shit. Normally, there's normally a consultant that's hired. They have to, to hire create, a consultant. To, a, yeah, to create the SOPs, um, logging procedures, equipment um, specifications, and et cetera. And they are the ones that ultimately they do the uh, pre-auditing and mm -hmm. so forth and make sure that you're compliant, right? And, yeah. and these are the guys that are, are putting it together as a compliant facility right. and preparing for those federal audits. Right. Um, so while there may not be federal audits happening uh, um, to most of these facilities, what they're doing is they're trying to get to a level where when the federal audit comes in, they can go, look, I, I hired the Weinberg Group in D.C. who deals with yeah. pharmaceutical companies every single day, and here's their aud recent audit that says, um, our equipment is up to spec. Um, our SOPs are up to spec. Here are data logging. Well, so and here's a—I mean, here's something that's that's going to affect people: is that a huge part of GMP is CIP protocol, clean in place protocol, and visual visual verification of things that are cleaned. And 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 I don't know how to do that with a lot of this equipment. Well, uh, and 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 and, spe and specifically being able to run all these systems on scale. Thank With that you. is really Thank where you, you have that nightmare. Like yeah. uh, we all here could design you something that would probably fit underneath that mm -hmm. area, but it would be very difficult to take you on such a large scale production, especially if you're looking at for like, you know, that federal blessing that you're going after. And that's why you're trying to do that. That means that you want to feed nationwide to be able to do something like that. That means that you want to be able to do something huge like that. Ultimately, all this stuff is going to process down to the exact same, in my opinion, the exact same way that you would process any other Mm -hmm. you know any other plant mm -hmm. material that's being processed mm -hmm. that gets sold nationwide like sure have you ever walked in one of those 
Sure. Yeah, it does I mean, not look really cool. GMP. Well, and and here's the answer, guys. The answer, and it's multifold. People are saying, well, you know, what about what about Canada? Well, what about Canada? Okay. What about yeah, Canada? Uh, I mean, you've got five, I don't even know what five. Are. You've got vertically integrated, five vertically integrated companies that are crushing the market. But what I want to say to them market. is that. Okay, thank you. Well, they're going to be no, exporting to the EU. The no, problem. they're going to be exporting to the EU, and it's going to go well for them. Sure so so part of what I want to say on here to answer the question is there is no GMP equipment. There are GMP yeah. facilities Good that include equipment practices. that's built that to a specification yeah. that have processes, training, quality it's, systems. It's, it's GMP. It's, it's not GME. Mm -hmm. I, actually, mm -hmm. I actually have worked out of a, G, a lab that actually did get a third-party GMP uh, certification recently for remediation only. Mm -hmm. And you're quite correct that it's like 99% of the work is paperwork and mm -hmm. tracking and yes. analysis. Yes. And to be honest, it's been hard enough for me to even convince anybody they should have an HPLC, let alone any kind of like microbiological or, or clean in place verification. Because if you're making statin medication, pharmaceutical medication, a cost of doing that business is participating in the GMP model. That is not a cost of business yet in cannabis. Is it smart to be aware? Is it smart to be planning? But I would argue that imposing that level of restriction on an already over-regulated business is going to put you out of business. That's what I would say. That's what. One hundred percent. Oh my gosh, they don't all have microphones, but they all agreed with me. Let it, let it be known. Let it be known. Let it be known. Uh, uh, Harrison, grab a mic. I think that's that's super accurate, and and one of the things that just shows that that's accurate is just look at how prolific the black market is. I mean, if you're already having to, you know, fight up against a system that is so. The black market is successful because of the amount of regulation that they already put on all of us, specifically mm -hmm. producer mm -hmm. processors. Mm -hmm. And because of that, you can make more money doing it illegally. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And if you put, if you make it where everything has to be GMP, you're just going to be fueling the black market. Mm -hmm. You'll never be able to actually even extract anything from taxes from people who are doing it legally. Mm -hmm. it just, right. You just, you just won't. It just won't be produced there. It'll stay black market. Yeah. No. Amen. Finishes <laughs> <laughs> yeah. up very nicely. Yeah. Um, yeah. One one thing that I I think um, that people never thought uh, that that we like to think about is um, cannabinoids and what their value is. And uh, do you mean uh, like metaphysically well, right, or like well, in my heart no, or by, by money by no, liter no, no, by, by we're measuring by yeah, liter? Exactly. Yes. Okay. And. Uh, a lot of folks are seeing right now that it's uh, more affordable to to run conversions on a clean CBD isolate mm -hmm. over trying to grow mm -hmm. uh, THC without having any pesticide drift. Mm -hmm. And what I think is the market's actually going to start turning back around to these isolated products. Um, and, and then reformulations. And, and reformulations. And, and, and I'll tell and you what, in the pharmaceutical low. industry, nobody, I mean, in nutraceutical is a little bit different. It's regulated differently. But in the pharmaceutical industry, it is con constituent isolated products reformulated into, like, if we're going medical model, you take it apart and put it back together. And, and I think right now, I, I think, like, uh, in the cannabinoid space, one of the, uh, besides the folks that are, I, I remediating the THC from their hemp at pretty large scales with huge upfront costs. There's folks like Murphy Murray that are doing amazing <gasps> Murphy is my girl. And, and actually being able to do some formulations. I mean, they're not isolated molecules, but that, you know, they're stretching out to get a, some really interesting fractions for reformulation. And, and if we can start scaling that to uh, isolation of, at least terpene profiles mm -hmm, and reintroduce mm -hmm. them to, you know, the, uh, the, the proven products and, uh, that the white papers say work, then we can actually hold off the money of the pharma pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. But I think we have to innovate. We do. Uh, we have to continue. And I, I wanna... actually have a question for you, Noah. Um, what do you think is the value in the future of organic, or, well, you know, terpenes being produced versus the THC that comes off of a plant. Um, I, I think that, I think it's a stoner in me that says that vapable products are pretty much going to be a bit of the future. I think the lungs are a great delivery mechanism. And 
Um, they work fast, and they don't gum up your nostrils. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> and um, I, I really think terpenes. I mean, we we see. Really do you mean the value, Harrison? Do you mean expensive. the value for terpenes on the market? Right, right. It, I mean, I mean, like from a from from a fine. So, so for I mean, for instance, I can take CBD and I can turn it into THCA. I can turn it into THC delta yeah, nine. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Uh, I mean, if you start with CBDA, you know. But if so, as far as that being produced, it's pretty much just the cost of CBD, right? Which is can be you know extracted and enlarged. Yes. But but the terpenes themselves are and, and that's what, you know a, a, that's also, something that we're actually developing a method right. for isolation of of cannabinoids without the use of distillation. We've been using membranes to reduce the volume of your solution and reduce a lot of ethanol, but there, you can also use it for purification of your. Uh, but purification of your crude oil and pulls out a lot of your uh, polysaccharides, cellulose, fibers, and it makes it, it makes a great product to go through a wiper. But I think that's a really limiting its ability. And what I've, we found that you know ethanol is cheap, and if we uh, ethanol mixes with mixes with water pretty easily, and we've got awesome systems out there with columns that are ready to have light hydrocarbons pushed through them, I think that if with a room temperature ethanol extraction, we can get to a point where the extract has not been overly heated, it's been water washed, but doesn't have any excess hydrocarbons in it, and we can introduce it into one of these systems, you aren't going to be packing those columns with, uh, with biomass anymore, it's going to be packed with silica. Wow. And we've developed a method for liquid to liquid that I'm going to, like, start talking to a few of these folks to for some crude samples that I want them to run. And I don't have the ability to run the light hydrocarbons. We're doing some of the heavier ones. Uh, hep, we're at heptane now, but getting really good results. And I'm hoping we can pass some of this crude off to these janglers. And I'll let your boy. Yeah. I got you. Har Harrison, would you, would you pass Andrew the mic for me? Um, Andrew, your business, uh, Extractor Depot, really covers, a, I would think, say, a wide range of sizes. Yeah. Like your customers are a, a guy in a garage right. to type $7 million concern right. mm -hmm. in a nice yeah. sparkling lab. Right. Tell me tell me how you manage to supply things to an industry that is so varied on scale. Right. Um, I think, you know, it's interesting because when the hemp market started up, you know, we were like, oh, do we need to chase after this huge, large scale equipment side of the business? And, you know, it kind of threw us off our, our, our balance. And that was something that, you know, we just like Boris said, like, you know, we were thinking, do we need to, you know, chase after that market as well? And, you know, we're strategically, you know, from a business standpoint, we couldn't do both. We couldn't we couldn't take care of our current customers and also bring in all these, you know, large scale equipment and you know, survive because the capital expenditure just holding that inventory is just, you know, way too high. And so I got you, by the way. Yeah, we're <laughs> holding that inventory for you. <laughs> you want to help sell? <laughs> right. Shit. So, and that's the thing is, you know, um, I think, yeah, I think that's that's the main thing. Um, you know, with, uh, you know, trying to focus in on a specific area of the market. You know, knowing what your customers are at in terms of scale. Mm -hmm. And knowing the market well enough on a consumer standpoint, mm -hmm. knowing what kind of products they're looking for as right. well um, and whatnot. So I think um, that's the biggest thing is knowing the market in terms of what, you know, what kind of products are being purchased and mm -hmm. then also what kind of scale of products are being sold. Because, you know, you can you can sell a customer a large system, but if they can't sell all the products they're making because of the market conditions, mm -hmm. then they're not going to come back and buy supplies over and over they're going to go on break or whatever. Alex, so. can, you, can I ask you a question? And then I have one for you too. I want to, I want Alex to, I want Alex to address this. Alex, your company is named C1D1 Labs, which is a, which is a box, but you probably have a hundred SKUs on your website. People don't just want to buy the box from you. They want assistance with all of the parts that go inside there and how to make this process work. When you're trying to, Obviously, you can't make all that yourself. You partner with Across and other manufacturers. Talk about trying to be that, being every everything it's to vertical, everybody. It's vertical it's integration. I mean, yeah. realistically, we're trying to do the same thing that every other business in any other industry in any other market is trying to do. 
Um, we're trying to minimize costs, minimize timelines, minimize communication. We're trying to minimize uh, minimize communication within other people, eight different parties, right? Mm -hmm. Maximize the efficiency of communication, mm -hmm. excuse me. Um, and really deliver a, a full product. Realistically, when someone tries to buy a C1D1 room, they're, they don't have an engineer ordering it and mm -hmm. they need to have one because realistically the equipment that goes inside of it, it connects to the room and then the room connects to the building and the building is then reviewed by the department. It, it's one big integration and being able to be that deliverable is, is what, you know, Air Cannabis or, you know, some of the big massive corporations that we work with and publicly traded companies mm -hmm. in Canada, that's what these they're looking for. Tell me, uh, could you let Zev go? Zev, All right. you have a couple of thoughts, but I also want to hear about the challenges of innovating equipment. I mean, there's a number of different people who could ask this here, but you need a, just building that, getting the parts, buying the thing, knowing what to get. Tell me about uh, some of the work you're doing there. It wasn't an easy process, that's for sure. Uh, and for a long time, I was hampered by not actually having a suitable space to do R&D in, and it was uh, restricted to, you know, loaning out uh, temporary spaces in mm -hmm. people's facilities to actually validate new membranes. Uh, the biggest challenge really is uh, people are always just asking for unique cases. They want customized equipment or they want mm -hmm. to tr you know, run a different solvent system than you've ever run before. I'm really happy now that I have a permanent demo facility where people can send me their own product, get it tested uh, with you know, the actual membranes mm -hmm. I offer and I can send them back the product post-processing and they can see what it looks like before, before making a decision sure you know sure. people were very people were very skeptical but it's nice now that, that uh i think i've come up with a good solution here with with a facility that's well suited for demoing has in-house analytics and can run uh just about any solvent system at least on the small scale for uh, research purposes um i have a lot do you have a uh, anybody have any passionate feelings about limonene because the chat has noah does noah yeah, has could you pass that to yeah. noah Noah, um, the, the chat has some passionate feelings about limonene, and uh, let's hear about that. Um, yeah, actually, I, I, I'm i sure those folks out there are uh, thinking about the uh, pioneer of, CO, uh, of limonene extractions, and uh, that was Horatio Delbert. Don't remember his, uh, Sabian, I believe is his mm -hmm. uh, real name, and he uh, passed away in a pretty unfortunate accident. Oh, shit. Sure. Yeah, uh, he was a, a wild, he was a cowboy that was pushing, uh, pushing, he was using CO2 uh, to take terpenes and also liquid, uh, liquid CO2, subcritical, subcritical. and he would pull great terpene profiles and then he would use limonene and, uh, and then he could crash oh, it, crash it out and, and uh, crash THCA out and reformulate the really unique in profiles with straight THCA and like he didn't deal with Delta 9 it was all crystallized out of CO2 it was just a really unique product hmm. and um, I when I moved to LA I actually had quite an endeavor in, in limonene because I I, uh, I saw that they weren't going to be doing any uh, any type 7 licenses and I wasn't going to use light hydrocarbons that I was used to so I had a bunch of big bags of old like two three year old keef it runs from the the hills of of humboldt and uh started extracting in limonene and running it through silica mm -hmm. as a silica plug not doing full, full chromatography and uh cleaning it up and then the and then recovering it in a 20 liter rotovape but you have to azeotropically recover it which can get really interesting it'll have some wild explosions of uh, if you don't have the right ratio temperatures of, of but you have to add distilled water to pull off the limonene as an azeotrope so there's the, and if you if and if you're not uh reducing the amount of if you leave ethanol on the solution and you mix uh the limonene you could potentially there's a lot carbone. to it there's, is, there's, there's a, a lot water. to I it I know. so wait is but, this but it was is a, this when it tastes like licorice yes is <laughs> this yeah. when it like yeah, yeah. It, it's 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 super like licorice it's a very peculiar smell what does it taste like it smells like it does it uh, taste like it as well oh yeah <laughs> tastes like it. it's not pleasant so uh but i, I mean i i didn't do I, I made products that were 
it was in the early days of my short path and they were actually uh, the the refined limonene extracts were better than the distillate that I was making at the time and they were easier for formulating into cartridges and learned a lot and over hours and hours of uh, of conversation with Horatio he's he, he's did a lot of experimentation that nobody's going to know about and hopefully well people do people do we got we yeah, got I, Chiba I would, Chiefs is here Will is here I'd like and, to, I'd like uh, to you know potentially start a thread on the on the uh, forum and and start to yeah. uh you know, to, uh, to, yeah, get some of those uh, those uh, messages out of Instagram, which they're not easy to translate no. over. But uh, I, I think that'd be a good project for some of the gang. Since you have since you have the microphone, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go first last. Um, I want to kind of wrap it up. It's important to me that people know how to get a hold of you. They know um, you guys are Good Life Gang affiliates. Dustin selected you for this panel for a reason. You have you have the um, the confidence of this this community for whatever that's worth um, as people who take good, could take good care of their customers do the right thing have a quality business and you all have that reputation and and I just want to honor you for that for having these are businesses that that have been in business a while and um, you guys have a good reputation people need to know how to get in touch with you and and make that clear for me Okay, uh, you can get in touch with us at ethosmanufacturing.com or on Instagram, ethosmfg. Um, You're we, doing we, a road show. Ethos is doing a road we, show we right now once a month. It's, You're it's all over the country. Down, it's slowed down a little bit with uh, some logistical issues, but we, um, yeah. But uh, go we, to Ethos Manufacturing and go to tour. It's easier, easy to register, easy to see the schedule, right? Yes, and yeah. listen to these guys too. I bought equipment from, I bought something from almost all of them, so... Uh, yeah, they're definitely some good co Maybe we'll do this industry. this side of the table if you give that to Zev and Alex there. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, I'm at uh, molecularforcesllc.com. The contact info there gets to me directly. And also at my Instagram of uh, Magister Chemist, you can see my latest Magister work. Chemist yeah, that's me. <laughs> I, uh, I, I don't have a, I'm not going on tour, but I do have a demo facility in Portland, Oregon that I would love anybody who wants to come visit, take a look. And I've got uh, at least 15 different kinds of membranes I can show you for various tasks uh, and just plug and play. Alex. Hello, everyone. Um, C1D1 Labs, any chance if you type into Google, you'll find me. Um, C1D1 Labs.org, you can email me, alex at C1D1 Labs.org. Um, I did want to drop today our LPG chilling solutions. Um, we have a five kilowatt chiller at negative 80, a two and a half kilowatt chiller at negative 80, um, a 17 kilowatt chiller at 10 degrees. Um, yeah, and it, Celsius? yep, and we public we partnered with a publicly traded company. Negative that 80, makes, it doesn't matter. We, <laughs> we, we, yeah, 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 100%. Negative 40. The idea is we partner with a publicly traded company based in the U.S. who provides all the chillers to Raytheon. And and the idea is we can provide the chillers that won't break down in a year. It won't break down in a year. It has the power to keep up um, with a lot of what you and you and a lot of the BHO guys want to do. Um, we spent a lot of time working on this. They're going to be doing a giant PR release with their publicly traded peoples. Um, yeah, great. Um, and we hope to really you know give that one year warranty service with this with a huge, massive company supporting it and give the uh, people a solution that is not as expensive as Heber for the, for the solution that we're looking for um, and is a little bit more reliable. Um, shots fired. I like shots it. Shots fired. I yeah. like it. I like um, it. So so follow C1D1 Labs. Follow Be us. We're going to release it on our Instagram. Um, nice. It should, it should revolutionize a lot of the problems that a lot of the chilling companies are having now. So if anything, push innovation in the market. Yeah, do it. Um, and give uh, a lot of these guys. A lot, so, like, a lot of these guys want to talk about how much butane you can recover in an hour. Here's your answer. Mm -hmm. what, what's, what's the answer? How fast? Uh, yeah, it depends on how much you're chilling, right? How much, how much is it? Tell us. How so many we don't kilowatts? Have to, so I'll tell you. Three kilowatts per pound per minute we, for N butane and all the hydrocarbons. Like it's so sad. Here. Three kilowatts per pound per minute. Yeah, so for we, all the we, hydrocarbons, mostly, I mean, it's rounded to these, one significant figure, but it's roughly three these kilowatts per pound per minute. designed with extra, extra G. Um, so I love extra G. Um, and we have 
engineers who can determine exactly, not exactly, but roughly how much you, you recover with their setup that you have. Um, it sounds hella electro passive. Yes. TM, <laughs> TM, 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 everybody. Uh, um, I, I, we don't say TM anymore. We say hashtag. It is. No, no. This is trademarked. It, it's actually it trademarked. It is using cooling. Oh, to oh yeah. Condense. I'll sue people over that shit. <laughs> LPGs. Okay, Boris, tell us. <laughs> electro passive TM. Tell us who you are, before Boris. Am I turn? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, contact me, please, at on Instagram at busyb999 or text me. Please don't call. Text first. I'll call you back. Sex. Or you can email me, boris at busybee.com, but I don't check my email, so text me instead. <laughs> or, and my text message is on my Instagram bio, so really there's no excuse. Just go to freaking Instagram, busybee999, and you can text me, Calvin, or Kyle, or our website, www.busybee.com, B-I-Z-Z-Y-B-E-E. Dot com. I love it. Andrew, how do we how do we follow up with you? How do we follow Extractor Depot? How do we yep. sign up for classes? Yep. Awesome. Um, you can find us at ExtractorDepot.com. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you can find us at Extractor Depot on Instagram. And, um, you know, you can email me at Andrew at ExtractorDepot.com or reach me at 909-835-5636. You can text or call anytime. I love it. Harrison, wrap us hey. up. Finishing where we started. You can reach me at Dirty Harry on Instagram, D U R T Y H A R R I E, and that's because apparently that name was pretty sought after. So I had to change it up quite a bit. But uh, yeah, I, I answer a lot of questions on there. I like to help people. I like to watch this industry grow. So you know, if you have any uh, not you know, if you have any questions that you guys want to run by, got a great think tank behind me. I've been in it for a while. So hit me in the DMs. Thanks. I want to I want to thank you all for being here. I've been watching the chat and you guys are so highly thought of. I mean, almost everybody on here has has been a, a customer of one of yours. Um, you've you've helped them on the forum. You've made them laugh, laugh by your ridiculous laugh. comments. But I mean, you guys are the are the real shit. You guys are the real shit. And, and having you here, this group right here is just um, power team. And I'm, I'm honored to be a part of it. I wish you nothing but huge success in your businesses and your personal life. And I am rooting for you. And if I could ever be of service, you know, I would absolutely do it. So thank you so much for being here. Good life gang event. This us. is it. We're calling it. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Woo! <laughs>